My name is Carolyn Gibbs and in this video I'm going to speak to you about a history of British frame quilts. What do we mean by a frame quilt? Well, this term arose from the findings of an extensive documentation project which the Quilters Guild carried out all over the British Isles from 1990 to 1993. They discovered a distinctive style of quilt in which patched frames were placed around a square centre and this style occurred with sufficient frequency to be given a new classification. Frame quilts. About 15% of the pieced quilts brought to the documentation days had this frame layout, including the one featured on the cover of the subsequent book Quilt Treasures. This quilt was made by the Thornton sisters between 1840 and 1860. This book still remains an excellent reference for the concept of frame quilts, and the whole of chapter two in the frame by Janet Ray is dedicated to this topic and includes a comprehensive description of the range of frame quilts discovered by the project. After a brief comparison with medallion quilts, I'm going to give you an overview of the features of frame quilts which distinguish them, illustrated by a selection of quilts from the Quilters Guild Museum collection and some of the frame quilts from my own collection, focusing in on these in a little more detail. I'm very grateful to Heather Audin, the curator of the Quilters Guild Museum collection, who has kindly given permission for me to show many of the images you'll see here. I won't be able to go into a lot of detail about each quilt, so I've included the names and acquisition numbers of those from the Guild collection, so that you could find them later online if you wish to see more detail. Pictures and brief information is available about each of these quilts on the Quilters Guild website. Some of my frame quilts can be seen on my own website if you search for carolyngibbsquilts.com. So, what is a frame quilt? This term was chosen to identify a style which was perceived to be noticeably different from the medallion quilts found in the USA. Those commonly have a large square on point at the centre rather than the smaller square set straight on, as in the British quilts. Medallion quilts consequently have fewer borders. However, it is acknowledged that the term frame quilt has been more widely adopted in Britain, and not so much in the USA, where the term medallion quilt is used for both styles. For example, if you search on the International Quilt Museum website for medallion quilts, you will see many examples of British as well as American frame quilts and a few from other European countries, such as the Netherlands. The frame quilt style can be found in early British and European quilts and coverlets, and inevitably in the quilts taken over to the USA or made by early settlers at the beginning of the 19th century. Applique was a more favoured technique in the US, and a narrow border forming an on-point square was added within the central square to many appliqued quilts made there in the first half of the 19th century achieving a more elegant effect, rather than a solid square. As the style of patchwork in the USA developed from the middle of the 19th century, blocks became the dominant design element there. Few patchwork medallion quilts seem to have been made in the USA for many years, other than the striking centre diamond format of many Amish quilts from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the first half of the 20th century which may have contributed to the maintenance of the large on-point square within a square format. Mary Claire Clark, in Collectible Quilts, page 37, attributes the resurgence of the medallion quilt format to the awarding of Best of Show to an outstanding example made by Ginny Bayer at the Great Quilt Contest in 1975. Since then, the style has become a common format, often including some blocks in the borders. This turkey red sawtooth medallion quilt from the Quilters Guild collection is thought to be British, but has some stylistic influences from an American medallion quilt for you to see the proportions that are more commonly found in those. By comparison, the centre of a typical frame quilt is usually quite small and is surrounded by a greater number of borders. This multicoloured frame quilt also features a turkey red paisley print central square set on point, but here this is much smaller, and it is surrounded by nine frames of hand-piece cotton fabrics in many different colours and designs. 
While the modern medallion quilts do usually use many different fabrics, they're likely to be well coordinated and carefully selected. However, the earlier frame quilts are usually true scrap quilts made from a wide variety of fabrics. Indeed, this is likely to be one of the reasons why the style evolved, as printed fabric was very expensive to produce in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Frame quilts could utilise even tiny pieces of fabric, even when mass production techniques had allowed fabrics to be made much more cheaply by the later years of the 19th century when this quilt was made. Frame quilts continued to be a favoured format in the UK until the general decline of patchwork in the mid-20th century. The placing of the fabrics here gives some indication about the sequence of working and how different sized pieces of available fabrics were used. All four sides of a frame do not seem to have been planned at the same time, as there is only a partial attempt to balance the colours equally. For example, the top row of this border with the squares on point has the same fabric at the centre of each, probably cut out from a larger scrap and used to make the whole strip, mostly with the same two background fabrics. However, these fabrics only appear rarely on the remaining three borders. Similarly, on the outer border of the half square triangles, this dark blue appears on the side and the top and the bottom borders, but there is none in the right hand side border, indicating that she had run out of this fabric by the time this section was pieced. This suggests that strips were pieced in a particular design from the fabric readily at hand until they were long enough for the required border and then stitched around the previous work. Let's start by looking at the centres of the frame quilts. Frame quilts are found with a variety of centre treatments. Some simply have an attractive piece of fabric for the centre, such as this early block printed design of a bird and nest in rows. This simple frame layout shows off these expensive pieces of furnishing fabric to full effect. A slightly later cotton and linen frame quilt also has a central panel of furnishing fabric that has a large vase of flowers design. A floral print was selected for the centre of this small frame coverlet, one of a number of quilts made by the family of Mifanwi Price. Printed panels were a natural development from merely selecting an appropriate section of printed fabric. In Quilt Treasures, chapter 2, page 20, Jan Ray suggests that the easy availability of printed panels in the early 19th century was one reason for the choice of frame layouts for quilts. These panels were very popular during this period and purchased for the distinct purpose of being made into quilts, coverlets and household furnishings. She also identifies rare examples of quilts with centres decorated using embroidery or canvas work. This is the central panel of the quilt shown on the previous slide and features a cornucopia within an octagonal frame. Another quilt in the Quilters Guild Museum collection, which features a printed panel, is the Sidmouth quilt. We can see a close-up of this here. The panel shows a bird feeding its young in the nest. An unused block printed panel of exactly the same design is present in the Quilt Museum fabric collection. Flowers were popular subjects, as on this block printed commemorative panel celebrating the Duke of Wellington's victory at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Flowers, trees and birds were also common subjects used for applique panels at the centre of frame quilts. The earliest used brodery purse, meaning Persian embroidery, which is a type of applique that was popular using 17th and 18th century Indian chintz fabrics, which had large clear motifs. These motifs could be cut out and stitched onto a plain backing to form a new picture or scene thought out by the maker. The edges of the cut out pieces were secured with a simple hem or blanket stitch. In this way, a relatively small piece of expensive fabric could be made to go much further. Here, flowers are cut out in their entirety. 
the edges turned under and they are applied onto the background fabric with tiny over sewing stitches. However, for this bird, the quilt maker has carefully selected parts of flowers and leaves and cleverly assembled them to form a completely new motif. Note that the legs are embroidered on afterwards. Applique was not often used for the borders of frame quilts, apart from those worked entirely in embroidery purse. The Red Manor House coverlet is an example with an extensive amount of applique, both in the centre and the borders. Each frame is divided into squares, with each one containing a different applique motif, including flowers, plant pots, animals and houses. These have not been fussy cut from motifs in the broderie purse style, merely having the shapes cut out from fabric with smaller overall prints. Each applique motif has decorative herringbone embroidery stitch to cover the edges, as seen in this close-up here. Applique was also used for the central panel of this coverlet, made by the children at the Cam Blue Coat School in 1874. The motifs include various animals, butterflies, people and stars, which have been cut from floral and striped cotton fabrics. Scattered motifs like this are more common in British applique, in contrast to the overlapping assembly of pieces to make elaborate flowers etc. found in some early broderie purse and the American Baltimore tradition. This Welsh wool applique quilt features lots of individual motifs in coloured wool, including hearts, stars and leaves. This well-worn quilt, which belongs to me, probably dates from the mid-19th century and also has an applique centre, lifting the otherwise pedestrian nature of the patchwork. This close-up of the central section shows that the motifs include pre-assembled stars and flowers, as well as individual hearts and diamonds. These have been arranged in a balanced design around the octagonal central unit and stitched down with tiny herringbone stitches, as can be seen of the star point in close-up on the right. Intarsia is an inlay technique. This is used when the fabrics are too thick for the additional layers created in applique. This brightly coloured Kent uniform coverlet is made from military uniform wool, which is thoroughly fulled so that it does not fray. This means that the tiny oversewn seams are sufficient to secure the cut pieces into the correctly shaped hole cut in the background fabric. Piecing can also be used for centres. Squares of early printed dress and furnishing cottons were pieced together simply into a checkerboard by Mary Robson to form the centre of this quilt in 1801. A later Victorian frame quilt has a large centre made up of pieced squares on point, which alternate between the light and dark lavender prints popular in the last part of the 19th century. However, the most common centre treatment for frame quilts is the choice of a small, simple patchwork unit, such as a pinwheel, as on this West Yorkshire quilt made by Florrie Sykes during the first few years of her marriage. An hourglass centre was another common choice, as seen on this purple frame quilt. More examples will be seen later on both the Dorset frame coverlet and the Cumbrian frame quilt. Note that hourglass units are used at the corners of this frame too. More complex patchwork centres are found as well. This Welsh frame quilt has an eight-point star at the centre with true diamonds. These are echoed in the cornerstones of the final border. The earlier Yarkham quilt from Devon has a pieced star within a star at the centre. These also have eight points, but they are assembled from half-square triangles, not true diamonds. A few frame quilts have a larger field of mosaic patchwork at the centre. As we're about to move on to a consideration of the frames, it's worth noticing the astonishingly tiny patchwork here. The inner frame of small squares in a trip around the world design has squares measuring just half an inch across, all stitched by hand, of course. <laughs> 
so now to discuss the frames in more detail. A typical British frame quilt will have between 6 and 12 frames, but there can be more or fewer than this, depending on the width and complexity. The frames usually vary in width and design, giving interest and variety. Frames can be simple or elaborate. This quilt has both. It is in fact two-sided. This side has a turkey red centre pieced in log cabin, surrounded by frames with varying designs, pieced from squares, triangles and rectangles. The other side of the same quilt has simpler designs. These frames were just assembled from rectangles or plain strips of fabric. The regularity of the rectangular patches suggests that these could have been sample pieces. Scraps of different sizes of rectangles were pieced together to form the irregular borders on this early frame quilt. While quite a few exquisitely worked quilts and coverlets have survived from the late 18th and early 19th century, more humble quilts like this are less likely to have been treasured. This multicoloured cotton frame quilt has lost parts of two sides. Three borders survive on two sides and five borders on the other two sides. It was made by Mary Best, who lived in Buckinghamshire. Simple, quickly made functional quilts continued to be made through to the beginning of the 20th century. This example was made in Scotland by the donor's great-grandmother, Anne Buchanan Reid, made from pale cotton furnishing fabrics and wool suiting fabrics. It is machine pieced and hand tied. This quilt at first glance appears to have been pieced from squares, but in fact, this early 20th century quilt cleverly makes use of striped fabrics on strip borders to give the impression of more elaborate piecing. Although some frame quilts have a few plain strip borders, the majority of frame quilts have a succession of distinct pieced frames set flush against the previous border. In this small scale centre frame quilt, made from a wide variety of roller printed cottons, one border design runs into the next, forming secondary patterns, particularly in this area where there are consistent use of similar tan and lavender fabrics. The King George silk patchwork coverlet dating from 1720 to 1750 also has no plain strip borders. It has a relatively small centre surrounded by 14 frames. All the frames are pieced, but the careful choice of colours reveals the frames clearly. I feel a particular attachment to this coverlet, as I spotted it wrongly described in an obscure auction, and was able to bring it to the attention of the Guild's Collections Committee, who successfully bid for it at a very modest price to acquire it for the Guild Collection. The structure of the frames alternates between rows of squares and rows of squares on point within larger squares. The consistent placing of two black triangles on opposite sides of each square in a square unit provides a unifying feature. Pieced borders were often of simple designs such as half square triangles, although that name may not have been used for them in the UK. Despite the fact that this Cumbrian frame quilt made by Bertha Mitchell for her sister Elizabeth's wedding in 1899, dates from the end of the 19th century, little thought was given here to the placing of light and dark triangles, which are randomly placed, losing the opportunity to make more distinct border designs. The Cockermouth frame quilt, made nearby at a similar date, is still scrappy, but more thought has gone into the placing of the colours. Fabric was much cheaper than at the beginning of the 19th century, so those with time and flair could achieve a more coherent effect. The sawtooth border, for example, uses the same three fabrics all the way round. The quilt maker was not able to do this on the next piece border, but she did select for the background a number of fabrics of similar colour and value, which gives a consistent effect behind the brightly coloured rectangles. Note the turkey red cornerstones, quite a common feature at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. 
This quilt contains many pieced borders of designs seen on the previous examples. We have the half square triangles. We have flying geese. Sawtooth. Rectangles on point and squares on point. Many frame quilts were clearly constructed without much mathematical planning. By simply making pieced strips and then just cutting them to length, even if this was not at the end of the design. If we look at the border here, large pale blue squares on point, the top and bottom borders fit neatly, but the borders on both sides have squares with chopped off points. Notice again, we have more red corner stones. This late 19th century Cumbrian frame quilt also shows a lack of planning for the pieced border lengths. The first pieced frame is rather crudely assembled from triangles. Most of these triangles have points cut off at the end of the border. It was clearly just cut to fit. Many of the outer frames simply consist of rectangles of fabric joined to make strips. However, there was some planning by the maker. If you compare the two side borders, you can see that the fabrics chosen for one side are mirrored on the other side. More about this quilt, including the rather bizarre quilting, can be seen on my website in the Antique Quilts section about frame quilts. The maker of this elaborate frame top was clearly a skilled patchworker, but still she did not attempt to plan the piecing to flow smoothly around the corners. If we look at a close-up one quadrant, we can observe the border corners in more detail. Many include part units of the patchwork design and were not designed to integrate the design fully around the corner. However, this is not surprising, given that although girls would routinely have been taught to sew, many would have received little or no other education at this period, particularly not in subjects like geometry. And particularly on an elaborate quilt with many small pieces such as this one, the inconsistencies at the corners are hardly noticeable. However, some quilt makers were able to plan their patchwork borders so that the design was well coordinated at the corners. The maker of this Welsh pinwheel frame quilt was able to form both the inner and outer triangle borders perfectly so that they met to form a large turquoise triangle at every corner. All of the more complex borders are well planned on this quilt, both the rows of little star blocks and the sawtooth inner and outer border. The Education Act of 1870 made elementary education compulsory for boys and girls, and although subjects for girls initially focused on domestic subjects, they too would be learning geometry by the beginning of the 20th century. Some quilters were, however, capable of precision planning much earlier. This intricate square coverlet is made from 15 frames of printed cotton hexagons, squares on point, kites and long diamonds made from triangles. Considerable technical and mathematical skill was required to achieve such precision, although it's not known whether this was done using calculations or through experience, trial, error and tweaking. Hexagons are rarely found in frame quilt borders due to the reduced symmetry compared to a square and hence greater difficulty in working out the measurements. However, this is a stunning example of what is possible using a carefully planned colour scheme in light and dark fabrics to reveal the continuous interlocking frames. The hexagon format has created problems at the right angled corners. If you study the border corners, you will see that Mary Prince needed to construct different corner treatments for the different frames when she made this coverlet at the beginning of the 19th century. <laughs>
In this hexagon frame top, several different designs are used to combine the hexagons into beautifully planned borders. Most of the corner treatments have worked out very well, although the corners on the outer border are slightly wonky if you compare the top to the bottom. This quilt top was made for Mrs Rebecca Hewitt, nay Hall, for her wedding in 1850 and passed on through her family before it was donated to the Quilters Guild collection. The star of the Guild collection, the 1718 patchwork silk coverlet, does have a frame layout, although you may not initially notice this. Some larger box cut across several frames. A subset of early frame quilts have less distinct frames. The central area, often a small pieced block, is placed within a large field of mosaic patchwork, often in varying designs or sizes. This Mariner's Compass coverlet was made by Mary Dennis as part of her dowry when she married Richard Cam in 1828. Quilts of this style are concentrated in the first quarter of the 19th century. This example has two broad frames, filled with half-square triangles arranged in two different ways. The inner section has the half-square triangles arranged with the diagonals radiating from the centre, clearly alternating between light and dark. In the outer section, the half-square triangles are arranged in continuous pinwheels. This example, shown at the British Quilt Study Group exhibition at the Festival of Quilts in 2018, has four different sizes of triangles. The smallest are in the centre, gradually increasing in size towards the outside. A similar increase in triangle size from smaller to larger is seen on this quilt, which dates from between 1820 and 1840. The backing and the outline quilting have been added later. The patchwork was probably intended for a similar frame quilt, but never finished, or maybe remodelled later. Let's look at an example in a little more detail. This large frame coverlet from my own collection has a field of three and a half inch half square triangles, that's nine centimetres, around a simple centre. The fabrics indicate that this was made between 1780 and 1800. Four 8 inch, that's 20 centimetre, cotton reel or hourglass units, often known now as quarter square triangles, form the centre panel. Note that there are regular placing of the fabrics here. The field of triangles around this have 444 units set with little regard for the placing of dark and light. They do include a lot of dark ground printed fabrics which were very popular at this period for both furnishing fabrics on the border and these dress fabrics shown in the central area. The 11 inch wide, that's 28 centimetre deep strip piece border is made of larger scale furnishing fabrics. Highlights of the many other sophisticated fabrics can be seen on the extensive page about this coverlet in the antique quilt section of my website. This early 19th century coverlet shows a field of Irish chain built up from uneven nine patch blocks, sometimes known as puss in the corner blocks. This has been remodelled. There were originally four borders, but now there are only two. The remodelling was presumably done to remove damaged areas. The coverlet probably dates from the first quarter of the 19th century, although it came with no provenance. This is the relatively small central section, which features a diamond with square corners, surrounded by a sawtooth border pieced from triangles. The nine patch blocks have madder prints, including a two-tone red faux damask, which has helped to date the coverlet to the early 19th century, when many fabrics were being printed which mimicked woven effects. Of a slightly later date, 
of about 1825. This piece of patchwork was probably intended originally for a frame quilt, but was never finished. This panel only measures 54 inches square, but does include a total of 3,876 triangles. It is hand-pieced over papers, but doesn't lie flat, particularly near the edges. The red frill was obviously added much later. You can see here in close-up the two sizes of hourglass units. These central units are one and a half inches square and the border has larger three inch square units. The patchwork includes many, many different fabrics, including lapis and Pompeian prints. Two distinctive types of frame quilts are not made with scraps of fabric, but with a small number of contrasting plain fabrics. Unfortunately, I don't have an example the dramatic red and black Welsh flannel frame quilts made in the second half of the 19th century, with a large bold centre and broad borders, although these can be seen in the Jen Jones collection. This red and yellow strippy from the Quilters Guild Museum collection has a diamond in the square pattern on the front within framed borders on one side and red and yellow stripes on the other. It's made from cotton fabrics and is hand quilted. This quilt is the closest I have. This quilt does have the dramatic large scale piecing of the plain colours seen of the Welsh flannel quilts, but this has been made in cotton prints. Another quilt which utilises a frame layout in a more structured two colour palette is the Sanderson Star. Designed by Elizabeth Sanderson, a significant number of these striking two colour quilts were made in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. North Country quilting designs run along the borders. And now to look at the quilting. What type of quilting was used on frame quilts? Many have only basic outline quilting, avoiding the challenges of quilting over the enormous number of seams in the dense patchwork. Some have overall quilting designs, such as the zigzag waves found on many Cumbrian quilts, clamshells or wine glass or other overall quilting designs. This has an all over chevron design, typical of the northwest of England, southern Scotland and Northern Ireland. Large wavy lines forming bellows are used for the all over quilting design here. Where more elaborate quilting was chosen, the designs were often placed within the fabric pieces to avoid the seam lines as on this English frame quilt. Each quilting design is all within one fabric piece. Concentric circles within large cornerstones, eight petaled flowers inside the smaller ones. All the quilting is within distinct patchwork sections. Four petalled flowers are found within each square on point. Even on the pieced borders, the quilting designs are within each piece of fabric. A square diamond grid is quilted inside these blue striped squares and there are chevrons within the setting triangles. This probably also made marking easier. Plain strip borders have continuous designs along them. Here you can see a cable twist along the border. And along this strip border we see parallel wavy lines. The outer border has parallel diagonal lines within large triangles. However, on Welsh quilts the way the quilting is arranged is different. As is commonly found in Welsh quilts, the quilting design is almost unrelated to the patchwork layout. The same structure and motifs as Welsh whole cloth quilt designs are also seen on frame quilts. Here, for example, a quilted fan corner covers several patchwork borders. Also, the edge of the fan is not quite lined up with the edge of the red square on point patchwork border as might be expected. The quilting design at the edge overlaps several patchwork borders. 
large beech leaves and concentric circles. Another Welsh frame quilt from my collection shows similar behaviour. At first glance, the quilting appears to be along the borders, but it isn't always. Quilting was often done in Wales from the back to make it easier to mark, and this explains why the quilting is not lined up with the patchwork on the other side. This section does have the quilting design placed within each square, flowers, alternating with groups of four spirals. However, although the same quilting design continues at the side, you can clearly see that it crosses the seam lines of the patchwork structure. On this quilt, the central patchwork section does not have the same design all the way around the first frame. It has a cream strip on the right and the left sides of the four square centre. And as we can see here, we now have a row of four half square triangles along the top and the bottom, and then there is a narrow frame with four pale strips with the four blue spot cornerstones. And there is a different quilting pattern along the top and the bottom over the triangles. These quilting designs all spill over into the next frame where these peach strips are. The boundaries of the other border quilting designs also do not coincide with the patchwork seams. There is a grid of square diamonds alternating between flowers and spirals. The quilting design on the outside is of church windows. So, to summarise the features of frame quilts. They are found from the 18th to the 20th century. They usually have a small centre set square rather than on point. These can be printed panels, simple patchwork units or fields of mosaic patchwork or applique. Up to 15 frames surround the centre. These can be plain strips, squares or rectangles, or more elaborate piecing, squares on point, triangles, flying geese, rectangles on point. These frames are often pieced as strips and then cut to length as required. And frame quilts are more commonly made from scrap fabrics rather than a smaller number of fabrics bought specially. If you're interested in the history of British quilts, you might like to come and discover more about the quilts in my collection at the online Heritage Quilt Club, which currently runs on Monday evenings or Thursday afternoons. At just £7 a session, we meet for an hour to look at just one quilt each time, studying the dyeing and printing techniques used for the fabrics, the layouts and the quilting designs, and if known, the family history of the maker. And if you'd like to look at any of these frame quilts in more detail, you can look at my own website, carolyngibbsquilts.co.uk or thequiltersguild.org.uk to see these again.